So good evening. Welcome to our webinar on hip and knee replacement surgery. My name is Louise and I'm your host for this evening. Our expert presenters are orthopaedic surgeons, Mr. Matthew Oliver and Mr. Richard Goddard. They'll be taking you through private hip and knee replacement here at Benton Hospital, which we are a leading provider for in Kent and Sussex. This presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. If you'd like to ask a question during or after the presentation, please do so by using the Q&A icon which is at the bottom of your screen. This can be done with or without giving your name. And please note this session is being recorded. So if you do provide your name, we will see that in the question section. If you'd like to book your consultation, we'll provide contact details at the end of this session. And Paul Faro will be on hand to take your calls from our private patient to 8.30. I'll now hand over to Mr. Matthew Oliver, and you'll hear from me again shortly. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, this is the Benenden Hospital Hip and Knee Replacement Webinar. I'm joined by my with my colleague, uh, Richard Goddard, uh, and I'm going to talk to you first about hip surgery, and then he'll follow uh, with uh, knee surgery. So a little bit about myself. Um, I was appointed as a consultant in the NHS in 2010, and I started working here in 2012. I've been on an adult reconstruction fellowship uh, about hip and knee replacements in particular in Alberta, Canada at the University of Calgary for a year prior to my appointment. Um, I performed double the national average of hip and knee replacements per year, usually, but with the COVID pandemic, everybody had a dive of their numbers. We're getting back up to speed now, which is excellent news. In the latest NJR report last year, I found out that I'd had four hips revised in 12 years, so that was quite pleasing. So including in this session um, is hip replacement surgery and knee replacement surgery to follow. I'll be giving a brief overview about osteoarthritis of the hip, what's involved with the consultation and the diagnostics, followed by the treatment options, the surgical journey, your recovery, and then a little bit of information about patient support tools. So firstly, <clears throat> osteoarthritis, it's a wear and tear condition. Um, it's hereditary to a certain extent. It uh, is usually of gradual onset, can actually come on quite quickly in some cases. There's no specific single cause. It may be caused by trauma in your youth, uh, when you've had a, a sporting accident that you've just shrugged off as a bit of a groin strain. Uh, it, there are risk factors, though, that can lead to arthritis of the hip. And I've uh, mentioned one already. There's a familial link. Also being overweight uh, and certain um, professions and sporting pursuits put more strain on the hip joint. Fortunately, it's a treatable condition, but it is incurable. There, there is, however, quite a lot of advancement in recent years about trying to preserve the uh, human hip joint with various techniques. These include using hip arthroscopy uh, and trying to nip the problem in the bud by changing the shape of the joint, by nibbling off bits of uh, uh, worn out bone or by repairing the, uh, the articular cartilage to a certain extent. But once the, um, the condition has taken hold, None of those things really, really, you know, they don't really work. The average age for requiring a hip replacement is approximately 69. That's according to the National Joint Registry. So the consultation process, you, you have 20 minutes with us and it's really to get to know each other. It's about developing the doctor patient relationship, which I believe is absolutely crucial for a good result. Um, it's an elective procedure and you choose to whether uh, to wish to have your hip joint uh, replaced. It's not like it's a life-threatening condition. So therefore we have time to develop a, a relationship and um, that should uh, hopefully get stronger throughout the journey, uh, starting off initially with a, a positive consultation. At the consultation, uh, a detailed history will be taken to include your past medical history, any history of an injury, uh, your medication, your allergies, and any other concerns that you have. 
some colleagues, uh, including myself, occasionally use the adult hips, uh, the Oxford Hip Score, which is a, a validated functional tool to assess how bad your hip actually is. It looks at 12 different uh, everyday events, such as walking up and down the stairs, doing your housework, uh, getting up from the seated position, and it, it scores the severity of the arthritis. This is quite useful in the patient that is undecided about what to do next. Um, sometimes it's a barn door case, the, uh, the hip is completely worn out and the patient is in agony, but quite a few uh, on quite a few occasions, the, the hip isn't too bad and the patient's managing. So it gives us a score that we can then um, reference against and repeat the score, say in three or six months later. Quite a lot of validated research has been done um, by the Oxford group about when the ideal time to have a hip replacement is. And the score is out of 48. Uh, and they, re they reckon around between this, a score 24 and 26 is the ideal time to consider having a hip replacement. Because if you leave your hip to get too bad, the muscles around the hip start to waste, you become less active, um, your cardiovascular um, ability also declines and therefore recovery afterwards isn't as swift and the end result may not be as good as it could have been if it was nipped in the bud. So following from that, you have a, a detailed physical examination. An x-ray of the pelvis may be required, which we can uh, accommodate for you on the day, but quite a lot of the time, Patients come to see us with an x-ray already provided by primary care, which is useful. Um, at the end of the consultation, um, it is my aim to provide an individualized management plan for each patient. Um, while the consultation is going on, in the back of my mind, I'm doing all of the sort of the diagnostic work up really to work out in my head whether it's your hip that's the problem, whether it's your spine or both. Or is it the muscles around the hip that are causing the pain? The history in the examination is the key um, is key to working this out. So I may require you to have further diagnostic tests such as MRI of your spine, MRI of your hip, and sometimes an MRI hip arthrogram. And that's when a, an injection of contrast is placed into the joint to look at the articular surface. Uh, and the um, the uh, the cartilage of the hip in more detail, especially a, a structure called the labrum, which can get torn, especially in a young individual with pain. After um, we've got all the investigations back, uh, we then work out what what to do next. If it's a spine problem and your hip is actually satisfactory. I can offer you a, a cross referral to a Benenden Hospital spinal surgeon quite swiftly. If you've got uh, wear and tear in the trochanteric bursa, which is otherwise known as inflammation or bursitis, this can be treated in, in the first instance conservatively with geotherapy, uh, activity modification, weight loss, and uh, analgesics. If it's a severe case of bursitis that, uh, that is not responding to these treatments, uh, then um, I can uh, call upon the interventional radiology team here at Benenden to do an image guided injection, which helps matters considerably. The same is the uh, case with gluteus medius tendinopathy, which is um, another cause of pain, especially in patients in the 70s and 80s. And 80s. They normally have a, a quite reasonable hip joint, but it presents and mimics quite similarly to hip arthritis. And again, if you can't get it under control with conservative injection with an intervention, radiologist can help. Treatment options are therefore divided into non-operative and operative. The hospital has a BMI cutoff for surgery of about 40 because a lot of uh, information show that uh, the patient is at higher risk of complications if they're considerably overweight. And also that, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, surgical complications, but anaesthetic complications. Too. So you've been, in, you've been advised to do your best to bring your weight down to as close to 40 you can, ideally like that, before going ahead with surgery. 
So the non-operative term is very similar to what I've described already. It's about painkillers, weight loss management, activity modification of light load bearing exercise. Occasionally, uh, a steroid injection into the hip, which is again provided by the radiologists here, can help matters. The caveat with the steroid injection, though, is that uh, if you did wish to go ahead with a hip replacement, we'd have to wait about six months because um, there is evidence to show that doing the hip replacement too soon after the injection can lead to an infection or increase the risk of an infection. <clears throat> and then the final option is the total hip replacement. The surgical journey really starts at the um, consultation process. Once we've decided that you need a hip replacement, I spend quite a bit of time informing you about the prehabilitation. And that means what I'd like you to do in the build up to the operation, that, that is to optimize your general health uh, with nutrition, exercise, and just getting a little bit more active in preparation for the op. I understand that you will be in pain, um, but exercise is actually quite beneficial in, in moderation. The next step in the surgical journey is the pre-assessment clinic and you'll come down to Benenden for the day and meet the pre-assessment team which is a collection of excellent hard-working nurses and a consultant anaesthetist usually. You'll have a whole selection of blood tests taken, uh, an ECG, heart tracing and any other investigations that they seem that, that they deem necessary. This is to pre-optimize you, to get you in the best shape possible. Uh, and I'm particularly um, interested in optimizing the management of diabetes because there's strong evidence to show that if you have poor diabetic control, that also leads to a poor surgical outcome and an increased risk of infection. It's important also to correct things like uh, anemia and high blood pressure. And again, the pre-admission team will either ask your GP for help or in some cases we can ask the cardiologists here to help you with further tests like echocardiograms, etc. The hospital um, is fully uh, involved with the rapid recovery protocol um, or heart recovery protocol for hip and knee replacements and has been for many, many years. And this essentially is um, a multidisciplinary approach involving the consultant surgeon, the consultant anaesthetist, the theatre staff, the nurses on the ward, the physiotherapists. We're all working hard together to ensure that you uh, overcome uh, the operation in the most effective and swift manner, because the best thing for you is to get you home swiftly um, and out of hospital. So the surgical journey continues with admission on the day. The operation uh, is usually carried out uh, uh, under spinal anaesthetic with sedation, so you're numb from the waist down, and you can be completely sedated or you can actually be completely awake. Um, it's your choice. Most people prefer to be um, fast asleep. We try to avoid using general anaesthetic uh, because spinal anaesthesia is much better at uh, lowering your blood pressure to reduce bleeding and also has been shown as an excellent analgesic afterwards. The first few hours after the operation, you're very comfortable indeed. It also has also been shown to reduce the risk of uh, venous thromboembolism or blood clots in the leg and the lung. The operation usually takes about an hour or so and you'll be away from the ward for about two to two and a half hours in total. Once you get back to the ward, you'll be closely monitored uh, post-operatively by a dedicated nurse in your own private room. And you usually stay for a, a couple of nights. It's possible to go home the same day if the morning is, if the operation is done first thing in the morning uh, and all the stars align and everything's perfect. It is certainly possible to go home on the, the day after as well. But the usual uh, duration of stay is two nights. You're, we aim to get you fully weight bearing on your new hip uh, on the day of surgery once the spinal anaesthetic has worn off. And uh, the, the, um, the physiotherapist will usually visit you uh, twice a day. So if you're ops in the morning, you'll definitely get a visit from the physio in the afternoon. 
the first day post-operatively, you'll have a comprehensive check with the resident medical officer and the nursing staff. You'll have blood tests taken and an x-ray of your pelvis will also be arranged. It would be expected that you should be mobile on two crutches at this stage and it would be hoped that you'll be practicing the stairs on the first day uh, by lunchtime or beyond. You should be dressed in your own clothes, sitting out for quite a long period of the day. Um, some patients, though, on the first post-op day do have what's known as a vasovagal, vasovagal episode, which is like a faint. This is due to the um, spinal anesthetic, and it's quite common, and the nurses on, and the doctors on the ward uh, are very skilled at dealing with this. This may mean that you'll have to spend a little bit extra time in bed just to wait for that to, to wear off. But um, usually it's completely gone by the second day. So as I said earlier, if you're doing really well and all the stars align and you tick all the check boxes, it is possible to go home in the afternoon of the first post-operative day. Day two, more physiotherapy is um, provided if you haven't been discharged, and this is usually the case if you've had a if you've had one of the vasovagal episodes um, on the first post-op day. When you do go home, you'll be uh, supported over the telephone, and you can ring at any time to the ward where the nurses will be available to log your call. And if they can't deal with your inquiry, they'll get hold of one of the surgeons. You will go home uh, with a four-week course of an anticoagulant uh, to take by mouth, a tablet called rivaroxaban. And follow-up will be arranged for you to see um, your surgeon at six weeks. If outpatient physiotherapy can be um, set up for you on discharge, that is a real bonus, and I'd certainly advocate that because that really does put the icing on the cake and makes a, a good hip replacement into an excellent one. It's really important that you keep up with the exercises and meet up with a qualified physio at least weekly to make sure you meet the milestones. It also reassures you that everything's going to plan. You have to stick to the hip precautions in the first six weeks. And in my practice, that simply means I'd like you to sleep on your back for the first six weeks, not drive your car for the first six weeks and be extremely cautious when you bend down to pick things up from the floor. The physios will show you exactly what that means and what that entails before you go home. Um, after six weeks, we can relax nearly all of the precautions if all goes to plan. At the six week post-op follow-up, you'll come back to the clinic and um, some people will come from far afield and it will be great to, to try and uh, make the most of the trip to Benenden. And we quite regularly arrange for you to have a checkup with myself and have physiotherapy on the same day. Uh, that would be the gold standard. I'd check the wound. Uh, I'd like to see that you'd be mobile with a crutch or a stick. Occasionally, patients walk in without any aids at all. You should be safe to drive again. And as I said earlier, we can start to relax the hip precautions at this stage. All operations carry risks. Fortunately, they're rare, but, but we, you need to be made aware of them. And as part of the initial consultation, a lot of time is spent going through the informed consent process. Listed here are some of them, the, the ones that, um, they aren't common, but they're the ones that happen most frequently. So infection, in a place like Benenden, it should be extremely low indeed because it's an elective centre with laminar flow air, ultra high clean um, theatres uh, and hygiene is um, of the utmost priority. We don't have any mix of cases. There's no trauma cases. There's no medical cases. There's no bowel surgery cases or anything like that near the, the joint replacement patients. So that's quite reassuring, really. So infection really should be closer to zero, but the average um, nationally is about 1%. You can get blood clots in the leg and the lung, as I alluded to earlier. So um, it's important to get mobile quickly. Uh, it's important to take the anticoagulants. 
you can get a nerve injury. Sometimes that's some numbness down the leg. Very rarely you can get a foot drop. Most of the time that resolves within about three months. Very, very, very rarely the hip can dislocate in the early post-operative period. If it occurs whilst you're in hospital with us, which is incredibly unlikely, but not impossible, then it will require you to go back to theatre to have it relocated. If it occurs in the community out of hospital, and uh, especially if you live out of area, it's likely you would need to go to your local NHS hospital for support, but please let us know so we can deal with it afterwards. There's a small risk of a leg length discrepancy. And of course, the implants do wear out eventually, but the modern hip replacements these days should last at least 20 years, everything being equal. To finish off uh, my presentation, there are several patient decision support tools available. Um, and these are increasing in, um, in vigor and in number uh, over the last few years. So you've got the National Joint Replacement um, registry surgeon's profile where you can look everybody up who does hip and knee replacements to see their general figures where they operate and their numbers and their volume there's the private healthcare network where again you can get information about surgeons and where they work um, and there are various review sites that you can look at patient reviews to make uh, help you with your decision making process so um, I'm going to hand you over now to uh, Mr. Goddard, my colleague, who's going to talk to you about knee replacements and knee surgery. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Matthew. That was a really interesting talk uh, and very informative. So my name is Richard Goddard. Um, I specialize in uh, knee surgery. I a bit of background about myself. I trained as a medical student at the University of Leeds. Um, I then did some uh, moved down to London, did some research into uh, knee surgery and ligament reconstruction and did a master's degree uh, at the University of London and did my um, senior surgical training in the Southeast uh, Thames rotation. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk to you about um, knee replacements. Um, Similar to hip replacements, it's a very common operation. Uh, the main indication is for wear and tear osteoarthritis, but other conditions that knee replacement is considered for include inflammatory arthritis, which tends to be more of a medical condition. You may have heard of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, conditions like gout can also affect the knee joint. Um, the knee is more prone to injury, um, especially with um, sporting injuries, skiing, football, um, you name it, you can damage the cartilage in the knee and damage the ligaments of the knee when you're younger. And sadly, this predisposes the joint to becoming arthritic. Um, we we'll also see people with uh, fractures around the knee joint, and this again damages the integrity of the knee joint. And even though surgery is often done when to treat a fracture, often it leads to arthritis in the future. The goals and aims of a knee replacement are similar to what we've heard Mr. Oliver talk to us with the hip. It's pain relief uh, of the painful arthritic joint uh, to restore the anatomy, the alignment and the function of the, of the leg and the knee joint, and importantly, increase, increase mobility and the functionality. Try and get yourselves back to doing the hobbies, activities, daily activities that you enjoy. Um, we're also now seeing a lot higher demand and younger patients with severe arthritis of the knee and this adds more challenging um, uh, problems to how we deal with a, an arthritic knee in a younger patient. Uh, next slide please. So knee replacement is a very common operation. Uh, our National Joint Register highlights approximately 100,000 are performed in the UK most years. Uh, that obviously dipped a few years ago due to the COVID pandemic. The average age of a knee replacement is similar to a hip, uh, fluctuates between 65 and 68 years of age. Slightly more common in female patients. And over 
94% of people on studies and questionnaires and, and health scores report a significant increase in their health and improvement in their well-being. It's to be noted this isn't 100%, not, there's not one operation that's 100% successful, but the vast majority of people have good uh, benefit from a knee replacement. How long do knee replacements last? Uh, the technology is getting better. I'd probably say that uh, hip replacements on average do better than knee replacements. Um, I usually quote an average expectancy of a knee replacement is between 15 and 20 years. But this is probably a conservative estimate where studies and joint registers show approximately 80% of knee replacements can last up to 25 years. Next slide, please. Uh, most of the surgeons here at Benenden use the Vanguard knee replacement, which has a very good survivorship over 96% at 10 years. <laughs> it's got a long um, heritage of a successful knee replacement, which was the AGC, the Vanguard's predecessor. And over 85% of these AGC knee replacements were lasting 30 years. So we're hoping the Vanguard will be similar, if not better. It can be cemented or uncemented, but commonly a cemented implant is used here at Benenden. Uh, and the surgeon will decide during the operation whether or not to resurface the, the patella, the kneecap. And there's various options uh, for uh, the knee replacement to be more stabilized if a patient has more severe arthritic deformity. Next slide, please. So what are the symptoms of arthritis of the knee? Um, early on, it may not be too severe. You may just find a bit of aching and stiffness in the morning, uh, pain on demanding activity, perhaps long walks or sporting activities. The knee may become painful, um, often on the medial or the inside of the knee. Some patients report the sensation of clicking and grinding, instability of the knee, locking, giving way and the knee become, can become swollen after activity. As the arthritic process progresses, the symptoms often become more severe. Patients describe severe daily pain, pain with standing, uh, start at pain, pain getting out of a chair, getting out of bed. And this progresses to pain at rest and pain at night. And patients often report being woken in the middle of the night with pain in their knee. Um, commonly, as the arthritis progresses, patients notice a deformity, which may be that the knee becomes bowed or some patients become knock kneed. Next slide, please. So what is um, osteoarthritis of the knee? Um, it goes through various stages, but if, if, if one was to look inside the normal knee joint, the cartilage surfaces would be lovely and smooth and have the appearance of a billiard ball. Um, the arthritic process uh, causes damage to the smooth uh, cartilage of the knee and the cartilage becomes crumbly and flaky and then becomes more like the surface of the moon uh, crumbling away. And this is grade three or moderate arthritis. And then severe grade four arthritis is where the cartilage fully peels away from the bone and crumbles away and patients have exposed bare bone and then the bare bone can touch together, which we call severe bone on bone arthritis. And it's this stage four arthritis when most patients would be in need of a knee replacement. Next slide, please. So what are the treatments of osteoarthritis of the knee? Um, similar to hip arthritis, we try other non-surgical treatments first. So if, um, if patients do certain activities which cause pain, activity modification is important avoiding, for example, running, jogging, and trying more um, activities that don't load the knee joint as much, such as cycling and swimming. Uh, weight loss is important if uh, your weight and BMI is higher than we would like. Physiotherapy is, is useful to strengthen the muscles and ligaments around the knee, which can help the arthritic pain. Should try simple pain-killing analgesic tablets, either bought from the chemist or prescribed by the GP. And some patients find knee braces, supports and strapping um, helpful, but not all. 
injections can be tried, which can be a steroid injection, as we've heard, uh, can be used in the hip joint. And often, uh, if appropriate, uh, surgeons may try um, a hyaluronic acid or duralane injection, which can be done here at Benenden. And put simply, this is a, a biological oil which is um, injected into the knee joint, trying to lubricate the arthritic joint. It must be noted that injections probably are not a, a great and effective treatment for severe grade four bone on bone arthritis, but can be tried if we're trying to avoid surgery. Surgical treatment is commonly um, a knee replacement, but uh, in younger patients, and if appropriate, uh, we may try to correct the alignment of the joint, which is called an osteotopy, osteotomy. Uh, keyhole surgery can be tried uh, to try and debride and stabilize the cartilage and microfracture techniques to try and encourage cartilage growth. Again, these are often tried in younger patients where we're trying to avoid major surgery, such as a, a joint replacement. And probably worth mentioning, but is very experimental at the moment and not many centers are having success undertaking it, cartilage transplantation, but this is probably the future of orthopedics and it's basically watch this space. Next slide, please. So prior to knee replacement surgery, it's important to get uh, as healthy as possible. Uh, we've heard Mr. Oliver explain the importance of this with the hip joint, and it's the same here with the knee joint. So um, good control of pre-existing medical conditions such as high blood pressure and especially diabetes to help uh, reduce uh, the risk of uh, infective complications. Um, losing weight to get the BMI to an acceptable level, which here at Benenden has to be below 40. Prehabilitation, gentle exercise, physiotherapy, uh, things like cycling and swimming, non-load bearing exercises are good to improve the muscle strength around the knee. You would then come to the hospital uh, for pre-assessment clinic to see the uh, nursing team for blood tests, health screening, and see the consultant anaesthetist to discuss the various anaesthetic techniques available, but commonly a spinal anaesthetic, as we've uh, uh, heard is commonly used for hip replacements. Next slide, please. So after the operation, it's similar to the hip replacement. Uh, on the day of surgery, you're closely monitored on the ward. Uh, medication uh, given to manage pain. Uh, sometimes if uh, one is feeling nauseous and sick after the anaesthetic, then this is controlled. Early mobilization on the day of surgery, once the anaesthetic's worn, worn off, we'd expect a patient to be helped out of bed, sit in the chair, perhaps walk a few steps with help with the physios and nurses with either crutches or walking aids and start to exercise and move the knee joint. It's very important with a knee replacement to get the knee joint moving, get the knee fully straight and get it flexing and bending beyond 90 degrees as quickly as possible. Patients usually stay for two nights, but if we do incredibly well, may go home after the first day and check x-rays and blood tests are performed to make sure everything's looking okay after the operation. Next slide, please. So potential risks, um, again, knee replacements, uh, vast majority of knee replacements go without any complications. But during surgery, there's a risk of um, excessive bleeding and one may need a blood transfusion on the ward the day after the operation, but this is fortunately not common and quite rare um, these days. There can be damage to the bone, uh, perforation of the, uh, the femur or the tibia, or very rarely fracture. Uh, there can be injury to nerves causing numbness. And again, a severe nerve injury is rare, but you can, um, if, a, if a nerve is injured, you could be left with a foot drop similar to hip replacements. During recovery, we closely monitor uh, for wound healing problems, infection. We give you anticoagulant tablets for two weeks to prevent blood clots in the leg, DVTs, and blood clots in the lungs, which can be uh, occasionally serious and life-threatening. Late infections are again fortunately rare, and knee replacements don't last forever. They're artificial, made of metal and plastic, and are prone to wear 
loosening and subsequent failure. And if this happens after 15 to 20 years, you may need a second operation to redo the knee replacement. Next slide, please. So there are many different types of knee replacement. Um, you can have a partial knee replacement if the arthritis just affects one side of the knee joint. Uh, commonly, this is the inside. And here at Benenden, we use um, a number of partial knee replacements, commonly an Oxford knee replacement. More commonly, uh, the, the arthritic process affects more than one part of the knee joint, maybe the inside uh, structures and also the kneecap joint. And then a full knee replacement is, is necessary, which is the more common technique used. And there are then more complicated knee replacements for specialist uh, indications such as severe deformity and previous ligament injuries and failure. Uh, next slide, please. So this poor chap here left his arthritic knee uh, to become quite severe. And we can see he's got severe deformity of both knees with what we call a varus malalignment. He's, he's gone very bow-legged. Um, and this uh, type of deformity usually needs uh, more surgical ligament release to correct the deformity. And we have to use a more stabilized knee replacement, which can be done and is commonly done here at Penenden. Next slide, please. If one ignores the arthritic process, it's uh, never a good idea. Uh, the joint can become more disfigured and worn. And this patient left the arthritic knee to get very bad. And we can see uh, the clinical photograph shows a very severe deformity, uh, which we can see on the x-rays required a more complicated knee replacement. And this is what we need to try and avoid. So. Even if patients don't wish to have surgical intervention, it's a good idea to have um, a surgeon check your joint uh, every year or every two years to examine the joint, examine the ligaments, perhaps take new x-rays to make sure there's no complications arising. Next slide, please. Uh, just to mention, uh, knee replacements can are commonly not linked together. They're uh, not a constrained joint. Uh, but occasionally we need to use a hinge which where the top and bottom of the implant is linked together but commonly this is for revision scenarios and patients with complicated medical problems of bone loss and severe deformities next slide please so with a knee replacement we're trying to uh, obviously cure the arthritis cure the pain we're trying to correct the deformity and uh, restore the individual patient's alignment and mechanical access to what it was prior to the uh, knee replacement. And there is a, a number of uh, techniques that surgeons can use um, to uh, try and achieve uh, this, um, this goal. Next slide, please. Uh, patients are generally getting younger and rightly so having increased demands with respect to sports, occupation and just higher expectations of what their joint replacement should enable them to do. And we're seeing younger patients present with severe arthritis and it's not uncommon for me now to see patients in their late 30s and early 40s with severe arthritis who may uh, sooner rather than later need a knee replacement. Uh, next slide, please. Different surgeons use different techniques, but uh, one we occasionally use here at Benenden is the signature technique. Uh, in my mind, this lends itself to patients with severe deformity, perhaps abnormal anatomy like previous fractures and uh, malalignment issues, which uh, the signature replacement can help um, overcome and achieve uh, better alignment. Uh, next slide, please. So commonly with a normal knee replacement, uh, one would just have uh, x-rays taken in clinic. Uh, with uh, the signature replacement, we need to do a detailed MRI scan of the hip, the knee and the ankle. And this allows a computer program to help, help the surgeon determine how much bone to take and how to correct the knee joint. It must be stressed, however, that not all knee arthritis and not all patients need this um, extra 
uh, surgical planning and the vast, vast majority of patients we see uh, a non-signature uh, standard knee replacement is the correct choice. Next slide, please. Um, all signature does is create specific guides that fit the individual patient, but the actual knee replacement that is implanted is exactly the same as one would get without signature. Next slide, please. So the results of any knee replacement should be um, accurate component sizing and positioning, um, recreation or uh, recreation of the normal alignment of the, uh, the knee joint uh, where possible, and usually an excellent on table range of movement. It must be stressed that most of us at the end of a knee replacement get an excellent range of movement of the joint in theater, but then it's down to the individual patient with their exercise regime and physiotherapy to maintain a good range of movement, both in hospital and then at home. Uh, next slide, please. And um, that's all I've got to say about uh, knee replacements. We can see here all the excellent surgeons that perform both hip and knee replacements here at Benenden. And now both uh, Mr. Oliver and myself will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Two very interesting presentations there. Um, we have quite a few questions, so I will go through these quite briefly. Um, how does having a bone graft as well as a total hip replacement affect recovery? Mr. Oliver. It just depends on what kind of bone graft um, has been done uh, before. Uh, I'd need to have a bit more specific information, but if there wasn't a bone graft in place before, when you have your hip replaced, sometimes you do need to have acetabular cysts. These are holes in the uh, socket of your pelvis filled with bone and we usually use your own bone to do that. We would be aware of those cysts on the preoperative x-rays um, and uh, that would be the only real indication for using bone graft in a primary hip replacement usually. Thank you. Um, next question. This person has suffered for a while with hip pain but they are only 51 which is obviously quite young for a replacement, is it better to try and wait or could it cause other issues by leaving it? I think I would definitely advise the patient to uh, come and get their hip checked out just to get a, a baseline on how severe it is because there's lots of evidence to suggest if you catch the arthritis reasonably early and uh, replace it when the symptoms are starting to be intrusive and uh, the outcome is usually better. What you don't want is for the hip to continue to grumble on and then suddenly get worse and then take the, the patient literally off their feet, um, which has happened quite significantly to lots of patients in the COVID pandemic due to the access into healthcare. So I would definitely recommend that the patient gets it checked and seen uh, by a sensible orthopaedic surgeon. Well, I assume that would be the same for a knee replacement as well. Exactly the same. I mean, we try and avoid major surgery in younger people, but occasionally it can't be avoided. So of whatever age, it's important to see a surgeon, get the various tests and get the correct advice of what should be done. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Oliver, would you mind moving on one slide so we can just provide the phone number? Thank you. OK, um, this person says they're in their late 50s and their job requires them to be on their feet most of the working day. If they had a knee replacement, would this still be possible afterwards? Um, during the initial consultation, we often uh, discuss the patient's occupation and expectations. Um, usually after a knee replacement, it's very painful for the first six weeks. There's six weeks no driving. So most manual occupations that require a lot of standing, the vast majority of people would be off work for a good two to three months. Um, maybe back at two months doing light duties, uh, lighter activities. By three months, I'd be expecting uh, most patients to be able to get back to most normal uh, manual occupations. Uh, however, those that involve uh, lots of kneeling, it may be difficult. And we usually don't promise that um, it will be comfortable to kneel. Uh, but if kneeling is important at around the 
six week stage, it's a good idea to start kneeling on something soft like a cushion on the sofa, on the bed, and then progressing to kneeling on a foam mat on the floor. But not all knee replacements are comfortable to kneel upon. Um, and probably it should only be, uh, you should only be kneeling for short, distance, for short periods of time. With respect to walking and standing up all day, probably at three months, still a bit uncomfortable, at six months, more tolerable, but it can take a good nine months to a year uh, for uh, knee replacements to be uh, tolerable to stand and walk for prolonged periods, such as working all day. Thank you. Okay, um, this one doesn't specify what type of replacement, they just say with a metal replacement, would it cause an unusual sensation during cold weather? Um, uh, so most, sorry, Matthew, yeah, you go, no, you go for it. On, Richard. I think you're going to say what I'm going to say, but I'll say my couple of lines. There's, there's no doubt that some patients have come to see me saying, oh, when the, the temperature drops or it's a particularly damp day, they have the sensation of something feeling a little bit cold in their leg uh, because it, it doesn't have a blood supply and especially a knee replacement is very superficial. Not so much of a hip replacement. The hip replacement... Most of the time, um, they forget that it's there once it's all healed up. Hmm. Yeah, okay. I agree with uh, Matthew. Uh, I do have a few people who say the knee is fine, but in the cold months, they just feel it feels a little bit chilly, a little bit cold. It's just normal and nothing to worry about. Um, this person asks, can you run after a knee replacement? They're thinking a weekly 5 to 10k. The answer to that is yes and no so as i've tried to allude to having a knee replacement isn't a quick overnight recovery it takes a good six weeks to get over the worst of it probably by three months i'd be expecting someone to be doing exercise in the gym perhaps cycling swimming i wouldn't recommend running on a knee replacement even though people do but certainly give it time give the ligaments time to settle down if one wishes to run I'd probably leave it for a good six months to nine months after the knee replacement. But my general advice would be to try and avoid running where possible. The knee replacement is made of metal and plastic. So the, the weak link is the plastic liner. And these are tested in the lab on, on sort of simulators and robots. And they only last for so many millions of cycles. So if one was to run 10K um, every week, and that's using many more cycles than someone who's just simply walking on it. Activities such as cycling are lower risk with a knee replacement. And I usually try and advise my keen runners to take up cycling after knee surgery. Thank you. Um, can you please advise how hip replacement, how a hip replacement is effective if you've already had knee replacements? Um. If you have an arthritic hip, uh, there's no doubt that you'll be in pain and you'll have stiffness. And sometimes, even though you've had your knee replaced successfully, the pain from the arthritic hip can be radiated or referred down to the knee. So um, quite a, quite, it's quite common to uh, go ahead and have a hip replacement after having had a knee replacement. And the outcome is usually very successful. The, uh, the caveat to that is the patient who uh, presents in the opposite way. They come to see you with um, pain in their knee, uh, but they've actually got an arthritic hip. And when you tell them that they don't need a knee replacement, they can't quite understand it because uh, they don't have any pain in their hip. It's usually a sign that the hip is extremely worn out and has stiffened up. Uh, and uh, the pain, instead of being felt in the joint, the hip joint goes to the knee. What is the recovery timescale for a partial knee replacement? I'd probably say it's, if you have in your mind, similar to a full knee replacement, but usually partial knee replacements make the milestones a few weeks and possibly months uh, quicker. So the pain isn't quite as severe. The swelling's not quite as severe. It's still a big, big operation. No driving for six weeks, probably six weeks to two months off of off of most occupations. But usually by three months, most people with a partial knee replacement are doing slightly more walking and activities than a total knee replacement. By nine months to a year, they've both evened out and both are doing about the same. 
but generally speaking, partial knee replacements recover a few weeks quicker than a total knee replacement. Great, thank you. Um, this person asks, is it possible to have two knee replacements taken at the same time? It's theoretically possible, but the vast majority of surgeons wouldn't recommend it. It's twice the length of anaesthetic, twice the length of anaesthetic complications. It's twice the insult to the body with blood loss and, um, and the insult of surgery. So commonly we would replace the uh, most severely arthritic and painful knee first. And then when the patient does well, uh, aim to do the second knee replacement quite soon after. So if, if someone has severe arthritis of both knees and is you know, really struggling at the six week stage, if they're doing very well, I would then list them to have the second knee replacement done probably six weeks later, leaving a gap of around three months between the two. Right, thank you. We have so many questions here, we might have to answer some afterwards. I'm just gonna go through a few more. Um, how long is the hip incision and where is it? Um, the hip incision is as long as it needs to be, but uh, these days of more modern uh, techniques, uh, it is getting smaller or shorter. I would estimate it to be, um, I'd say, a, a minimum of about eight centimetres to a maximum of 15 centimetres. The position of the, uh, the incision depends on the surgical approach that the, your surgeon utilises. Uh, there are several. Um, the most common surgical approach is used at Bennington Hospital and um, usually in the UK are the direct lateral approach and the posterior approach. So the posterior approach would be uh, on the, the posterior lateral aspect of your buttock, so just, um, just uh, above where you're seated, if you like. And the direct lateral approach is literally on the side of the hip. There are other approaches as well. Um, there's the anterior approach, which is um, becoming more popular. Uh, that uh, is quite popularized, popular, uh, popular in um, Europe at the moment. And some surgeons in the UK are starting to do it more regularly. Um, so that, that's the incision on the front of the hip. Okay, we have a similar question regarding the knee. Is it always at the front or can it be at the side of the knee? The vast majority of surgeons would do a direct midline approach to the knee joint. So that's bang in the middle of the knee joint, centered over the patella. And the length of the incision would usually be about 15 centimeters because one has to dislocate the kneecap to get into the knee joint. Uh, you can use smaller incisions, but it depends on the patient's deformity, uh, the severity of the arthritis and um, and their size of leg, be it muscles or um, fatty tissue. Okay. Um, we've had a couple of questions from members. So uh, hip or knee replacement is not covered by membership, but you will get a 10% uh, discount at the hospital if you're a member, so you know. So I'll just cover that one off quite easily there. Um, <laughs> does a hip or knee replacement make the security system arch go off at an airport? Yes, it does. <laughs> yep. Okay. I guess you just, how do you prove that you've had that? Sorry, my, well, my... I, It's easier with a knee, I must say. Um, I tell patients that it, the security may go off and a lot of patients do report during their holiday. It has gone off, but simply like anyone else, you would empty your pockets and then you'd show the security man your scar over your knee. Uh, and then they put their sort of metal detector gun over it. And that proves there's an implant there. With a hip, it's obviously in a slightly more uh, personal area, and this may then have to be proven in the sort of side room uh, at the airport. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this person says um, they're 75. Their orthopaedic consultant tells them not to think about a total knee replacement until they cannot walk until the end of the garden. Um, he says cannot guarantee to be better than now, or is even as good as now. How do you decide when to proceed with a total knee replacement? Yeah, I'd, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say there's any definite, uh, you know, walking distance that you need to not be able to do to, or to be able to do to deserve a knee replacement. It's. 
I would say when the patient has severe pain, pain every day, often pain at rest, pain with minimal activity, uh, pain at night, and certainly pain limiting their activities. So if they want to walk on a Sunday, uh, you know, around the park and they think I'm not going to do that, even though it's only 20 minutes because my knee's so painful, then that's the time to have a knee replacement if the x-rays, arthritis, clinical examination, all point to it being an arthritic problem. If the pain is coming from elsewhere, nerve damage or from the back or the hip or muscles, soft tissues, then obviously a knee replacement may not be the answer to that person's pain. Okay. Um, just last couple of questions because I'm afraid I just have so many in them. Not enough time. Um, this person says, they understand the older the patient, the greater risk of clotting. And by that, um, and that by having an epidural anaesthetic, the risk is somewhat smaller. This person's 80, year old, 80 years old and would want the risk to be as small as possible. What is the criteria for determining whether an epidural would be appropriate for them? Um, so first of all, um, it would be a spinal anaesthetic. Epidural anaesthesia is slightly different. And um, uh, we spoke about it in our talks that the, uh, the spinal anaesthetic does reduce the risk of uh, blood clots. Um, all the precautions are taken uh, right from the start, really. In the initial consultation, we have to complete a, uh, a risk assessment for a venous thromboembolism. And um, that is very comprehensive. And it's without doubt that a hip or knee replacement would be considered high risk of blood clots. Hence, uh, we offer the, uh, the oral anticoagulant uh, for four weeks for a hip and two weeks for a knee. But also there are other adjuncts available. So the patients would come back to theatre with Flotrons on. These are pneumatic devices that squeeze the patient's calves while they're in bed before the spinal anaesthetic uh, wears off to keep the circulation going round. There are other smaller versions known as uh, foot pumps that squeeze your feet. The patients find them very annoying because they make a little noise every five, ten minutes. But they, uh, they, they do the job um, and they're usually discarded on the first post-operative day once the patient gets more mobile. Some patients can also, if they're high risk, uh, have anti-embolism stockings applied. We um, don't use them routinely here at Benenden, but they are available on request. And of course, it's important to keep well hydrated um, to uh, stop your blood getting too sticky. Uh, so yeah, we, we take all the precautions necessary. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, so the final question is, how long does it take to get back to normal after a knee replacement? And therefore, how long should you wait for having the second knee replaced? Um, I'd probably say on average at the three month stage, most patients would say they're happy they've had their knee replacement. Uh, their pain is better. They've noticed they can walk a little bit further and they can get back to their activities. But at three months, the knee replacement still may be a little bit achy, a little bit swollen, a little bit stiff. You must carry on with working hard with the exercises. And usually it takes a good six months further, um, around nine months to a year, for the knee replacement to fully, fully settle down and all the little niggles go away. When to have the second uh, side replaced is really when the patient feels ready. Um, if they're able to function and get back to normal activities, get the muscles strong, then that's often a good idea and not rush in. Um, Richard, you just muted just muted yourself by accident, I think. Sorry, uh, no. can you hear me now? Yep, so yes. commonly, um, if the arthritis isn't too severe, uh, waiting around six months to a year is about normal. If I see someone who has a very severe arthritis of both knees, such that they are wheelchair bound, a house bound, chair bound, then as said, um, at the six week stage, if they're doing well, we'll then start planning the second operation. Okay. Thank you very much, both of you. And I'm sorry if we didn't answer all of your questions. If you've provided your name, we will do so via email um, either tonight or tomorrow, next few days. Um, if you'd like to discuss or book your consultation, Paul from our private patients team will be available this evening to take your calls for another hour until 
um, just use the contact details on the screen. Um, also, you could call that number from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday to speak to someone and book a consultation. Um, we're offering a special discount for joining the session. Um, the 50% the discount is on the screen with the terms as well. Once we close this webinar, you will receive a short survey and I'll be really grateful if you can spare a few minutes to let us have your feedback. It really helps shape future events um, for our patients. Um, our next webinar is on Monday, the 30th of January, and it's on gynecology. Um, just take a look at our website to sign up to that. And then, so on behalf of our expert team at Benton Hospital, I'd like to say thank you for joining us today, and we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.